Jackie. Come on, Jackie. Go, okay, Jackie. so it's awesome to be here with you guys. Um, we didn't think we would be back on Zoom for midweek, right? But due to this, um, what they're calling it a, a bomb uh, cyclone approaching, you know, causing mudslides here in San Mateo already and some flooding, we had to do it. So <laughs> prayerfully, it'll be behind us after this and then we can hug each other in person. But uh, I'm super excited to be with you guys tonight. Um, tonight, I was thinking, I was praying, I was thinking, okay, what um, do I feel that uh, we as women need for 2023? Um, as you guys know, the winter workshop is right around the corner in a week. And we're going to talk a lot about miracles and faith that we need to see those miracles. But tonight, what I want to talk about is having an awe for God. Okay. Standing in awe of God. So the title of my lesson for tonight is the awe deficit. Okay. The awe deficit. And um, so think about it. What comes to your mind when you hear the word awe? Okay. What is awe? So in Hebrew, um, awe is translated to yora, which means the awareness of someone else being present. The awareness of someone else being present. In this case, God, God being present. It also means fear. It can mean admiration. It could mean reverence. So, um, and there's such a deficit of this today. So what is deficit? Okay, I want to explain that because I know that someone was like, what is deficit? So deficit means the amount of which um, something is too small, okay? Like not having enough of this. So sometimes you'll hear like, oh, I have a vitamin D deficit, the deficiency, right? So um, tonight's lesson is called the odd deficit, okay? So the reality is that all of us are in awe of something or of someone in our lives. Our hearts are always captured. They're always captivated by something in our lives. And that's how God made us. Like God made us to be in awe of him. And all too often we stand in awe of everything else in our lives, but God. And where you look for awe, is super important because it will shape the direction of your life. You know, where you put your the awe in your life, it will shape the direction of your year of 2023. Come so on, my first point is stand in awe. Okay, stand in awe. So let's start off in Psalms um, chapter 33, verse one. We're going to start in Jackie. verse one and we're going to read to verse eight. Okay. So it says, sing joyfully to the Lord, you righteous. It is fitting for the upright to praise him. Praise the Lord with the harp. Make music to him on the 10 string lyre. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully and shout for joy. For the work of the Lord is right and true. He is faithful in all he does. The Lord loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of his unfailing love. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, their starry host by the breath of his mouth. He gathers the waters of the sea into jars. He puts the deep into storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the people of the world revere him. In the King James um, version, it says, let all the inhabitants stand in awe of him. So in verses one and two, the psalmist starts off by calling us to sing joyfully. It says, sing joyfully. It says, praise. It says, sing a new song, shout for joy. And he says, why? Because it's fitting. He says, it's fitting. In other words, because it's the right thing to do, right? He then begins to explain why. In verses four to eight, the psalmist begins to elevate the majesty of God's word. It's right. It's true. And in other words, it's trustworthy. Like you can actually put your trust in him, in God. And he describes being faithful in, um, he describes God as being faithful in all that he does. So there is no spot in the earth where the traces and the footprints of God's love may not be traced. Like his footprint is in everything on earth. And 
In other words, the greatness of God is at the core. It's, it's, it's in his core. It's the core of, of the character of God, the greatness of God. And it's who he is and it's who he's always going to be. He's never going to change. He doesn't change. He's constant. Not like us where we could be sometimes, you know, up and down. He's not like that. This is who we serve. Yet his greatness is not even limited to his goodness. Like he's good. It shows that he has power. He has authority. And he actually spoke. It says he spoke everything into existence, right? That's the power of his word. The stars in the sky are there simply with a breath of his mouth. It says that he gathers the waters of the sea and he keeps them in place. That's how powerful he is. And maybe some of you, I don't know if, if you guys have gone to Niagara Falls, but Fernando and I, uh, we went on a campus conference there uh, like a hundred years ago. Okay, maybe like 20 years ago or something like that when we were in, in campus ministry. And, you know, like a GLC, they had that for campus and um, only campus. And we went to Toronto. So we saw Niagara Falls on the Canada side. And um, all of us, you know, got on this boat and it's like a tour and they had us wear ponchos and these little tiny, like super thin <laughs> plastic ponchos. And we're going, we're like all excited with our, you know, waterproof cameras. And then we get there and it gets super close. And it's like, oh, it's like, like, you know, you're thinking you, it's like a mixture of danger. Like I could probably not live through this. And uh, another side of like awe inspiring force, like all at the same time, like I could literally die, but this is so beautiful, you know, and the power of that mighty cascade, okay, that the water was just so overwhelming and no one stands in front of Niagara Falls and says, I am so awesome, you know, like. You, no one would stand in front of Niagara Falls and be like, oh gosh, my, my split ends, like they are out of control or, and these pimples right here, like they're bad. No, right. This is like overwhelming, powerful waterfall. It, it gives the opportunity for self forgetfulness. You know, you're standing on, and you're looking out at this vast, glorious display. And Come on, Jackie. You're thinking, you understand like that God and his creation is so amazing that he's so big and that I'm just so small. And, you know, this is this is why the psalm says, let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. Yet this is the opposite of what Satan wants us to do. He understands the power of God. He understands the peace. He understands the joy that comes from revering God in this manner. So he will do everything in his power to make your view of God small, to view yourself as greater to have a superficial and shallow view of who God is. This is what Satan wants to do. So let's go and look into this a little bit more in Matthew um, chapter 13, verse 53. On, let's go, Jackie. This is awesome. Matthew on, 13, Jackie. verse 53. It says, when Jesus had finished these parables, he moved on from there. Coming to his hometown, he began teaching the people in their synagogue, and they were amazed. Where did this man get this wisdom and these miraculous powers? They asked, isn't this the carpenter's son? Isn't his mother's name Mary? And aren't uh, his brothers James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas? Aren't all his sisters with us? Um, where then did this man get all these things? And they took offense at him. But Jesus said to them, a prophet, not without honor, except in his own town. And oh, a prophet is not without honor, except in his own town and in his own home. And he did not do many miracles there because of their lack of faith. And 
Amen. We're going to learn a lot about that next week. But so Jesus here, he went back to Nazareth, right? Where he grew up and he was born in Bethlehem, but he grew, he grew up in the hometown of his parents. And he did, um, as he did in other places, he went straight to the synagogue right? He, he goes straight there, which was their place of worship to teach and to preach. Okay. Something that we, we can get a conviction on. So in verse 54, they say, it says, where did this man get this wisdom and these mighty works from? So you think it's like, they don't, they don't stand in awe of him, right? They're actually skeptical, you know, skeptical about, you know, him and they're questioning his abilities and the words mighty works could be translated simply as power. And actually it's miraculous power. This is strange to them because they remember Jesus as the local boy, you know, like who, is, what? And in verse 55, they say, is not this the carpenter's son? And they start saying all these facts about him, right? Yeah, his mother's name's Mary and his brothers are James and Joseph and his sisters, we know them. And so you see, they see him in a, they have a shallow view of him. They have a shallow familiarity with Jesus. They know true facts, you know, about his dad, his mom, his siblings, his sisters, his, you know, family's trade. They, they know that he, carpentry, but really they're only acquaintances. You know, they're, they're acquaintances of Jesus. Um, they, they know some things about him, but they don't really know him. And I remember, um, I used to love listening to Joe Willis's sermons and maybe some of you guys probably also love listening to his sermons. So he leads the church in Sydney, Australia. So we were, um, at a, at a GLC, I think a few years back and I, and I see him in the hallway and, um, and I say, Joe, how are you? And, and he's looking at me like, like, who are you? You know, like, I don't, I don't even know you. And oh but she God. says, but he says, hi, my sister. <laughs> I was like, I didn't even really know him. And honestly, that's what it, that's what happens sometimes. I thought because I would hear his, you know, sermons all the time. I'm like, hello, I know you, but honestly, you may know many facts about the one true God, but it doesn't mean that you really know him. And we see here that they oh, have a superficial knowledge of him. Their knowledge does not go beneath the surface. And because they mistakenly think that they know him, they lack a true sense of awe that they're actually standing before the true son of God. And literally the living word is right in front of them and they're missing it. Even with the evidence, you know, the wisdom and the miraculous power, in a way they see him and yet they don't really see him. And it's like the scripture in Isaiah and in Mark 4, we're going to see Isaiah later, but it says, ever seen, but never understanding. And Satan will try to do this with us, ever seen, but not deeply knowing. Satan wants us to have a superficial understanding of the God we follow and the power his word truly has. He wants us to have a superficial view of this. He wants the spiritually older sisters to fall into this allless, mundane, superficial, ungrateful relationship with God, where it's just a routine. I, you know, I've been there. He wants us to not be in awe and, and just have it be a checklist, you know, check done. Now I can go back to the kids, check done. Now I can go back to work. And he wants the younger disciples to stay surfacey, to stay a baby, you know, because he knows that this way, when the trials come and the moments of difficulty come, or when you don't get what you want, or where disappointment happens, then your roots won't be deep enough. And you'll want to fall away Come on, Jack. because when you have that deep knowledge of who God really is, there won't be apathy. 
There won't be indifference. There won't be boredom or bitterness towards God. Instead, there's like an awestruck wonder and, and an all-consuming reverence and a deep gratitude. Like, I need God. I can't leave him. I can't fall away. I want to be better for him. And then what happens is that you, you don't direct your awe someplace else. When you're fully in awe of God, your awe stays where it needs to stay and you don't place it on something else. And, you know, we have to be those who stand in awe and revere God's word. If you are studying the Bible, you know, um, if don't lack urgency, if you're lacking urgency, that means that you have an awe deficit. You're not in awe of God yet. Like you, you're not, you're in the surface. You, you've only got to the surface of it because if you really understood who God was, you would want to be baptized right now. And you'd want to have a relationship with this awesome, powerful God, which is the God from the Bible. Then you would take his word seriously and let it move you and truly change you. And it's the same for disciples on a daily basis, right? You know, we, we can't be like the Nazarenes who were right in front witnessing Jesus's power and mighty works, but didn't really see him. You know, sisters, you and I, every morning, we have the opportunity to stand in awe and be amazed at his words. We have that opportunity. Some people don't. Every morning, we get to stand in the presence of the living word himself. And that's why our quiet times should be rich. They should not be surfacey. Our prayer times need to be exciting and special. You know, I used to have a prayer closet and, you know, for a while it was good. But then after that, I was like, what am I? I don't want to be praying here. Like it just for me. Okay. And for some people, prayer closets are amazing. Right. But then for me, you have to find out what works for you. Um, I had to just leave the house. And so I had, to, you know, I needed to go on prayer walks every day. And, uh, you know, I want to challenge you to make your time with God special. Study out um, the attributes of God. This really helped me, you know, to find out um, that he's uh, omnipotent, uh, self-existent, um, that he's of uh, you know, um, sovereign, that he's infinite, that he's, you know, all these great attributes of God. And sometimes because we don't know what these actually mean, then we begin to want to possess these attributes. Like I can do that. No, 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 no. You can't. <laughs> Those attributes only belong to God, <laughs> you know? So we need to learn them and know them so that we don't try to be them. Okay. So there's a great book called none like him. And it lists, um, it goes through all the attributes of God in one book. So if you know, it's on Amazon, if you guys want to look at it, um, another thing, another practical, I guess you can say for this point is acts two forty three. Okay. Acts two forty three. It says that they were filled with awe at the many wonders and signs. We read the scripture a lot, right? In Bible studies. In the NLT, it says um, they were in awe at the many miraculous signs, okay? When they saw all these signs, they and the wonders, that filled them with awe, okay? Some of you know, um, I've kept a gratitude journal and it's been about three and a half years. Okay. And I write down everything where I feel I see God. And it actually started during a pretty dark time in my, you know, my life, because, um, you know, it was actually 20, I think 2020 or a little bit before, maybe the end of 2019. And when my daughter had had her accident and she had lost all of her speech and I started writing down all of her words, this is how it started. I started writing down all of the words that she was saying. And it started from one word because she was at zero after she fell her, her traumatic brain injury. Then it was one word. Then it was two words. Then it was five. Then it was 50. Then it was a hundred. And I couldn't even write anymore because it was so many. And it just filled me with joy. But then I started thinking, wow, what if I write 
um, the things that I see God doing in my life around me, the little things, the sm small things and the big things and just write them down. And um, I write them every day sometimes because it helps me to be encouraged. And sometimes, or sometimes I'll just do it on Sunday evenings. But I reached 3,000. I, I called it Texas Blessings when I was in Texas in two, for two years. Texas Blessings, 3,000 of these. And when I moved to California five, six, five, six months ago, um, I started one for California. And right now I'm at, I think, like 1,400 already. So you see, the more that you start writing, the, the, the more like you, be, you start getting more grateful. And then it's like easy, like, wow, to see God in everything that you have in your life. And what it does, it helps you to stay in awe of God and, you know, to see God's goodness, to focus on his faithfulness. So how do we know? Okay. How do we know if we are becoming awe deficient? Okay. How do we know that? So for point number two, we're going to go over some symptoms of, of having an off deficit. Okay. So point number two is the symptoms of an odd deficit. Let's okay. Go, Jackie. So let's turn to Romans chapter one, verse 18. And Come on, Jackie. Let's go, Jackie. Romans one. I think I'm going to read it in my. Okay. It says. It's a little bit, I'm going to read quite a bit. Okay. So the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Since what may be known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them. Um, for since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like a mortal human being and birds and animals and reptiles. Therefore, God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served created things rather than the creator who, for, who is forever praised. Amen. Because of this, God gave them over to shameful lust. Even their women exchanged natural sexual relationships for unnatural ones. In the same way, the men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust uh, for one another. Men con committed shameful acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for their error. Furthermore, just as they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, so God gave them over to a depraved mind so that they do what ought not to be done. They have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. Depravity. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. They are gossip, slanderers, God haters, insolent, arrogant, and boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. They have no understanding, no fidelity, no love, no mercy. Although they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death, they not only continue to do these very things, but also approve of those who practice them. So this passage shows us just how the battle is, you know, how there is a real battle to fight against having an awe deficit, you know, um, of God. And I wanted to read the, um, a, a small part of the, in the TPT, uh, version. I thought I had, it said, um, yeah. Sorry, guys, I thought that I had highlighted it, but it says there's a verse that talks about the fingertips of God were upon them, yet they refused to honor him as God or even be thankful for his kindness. That's in the TPT. The fingertips of God, again, you know, it's it's from uh, connects with our first scripture, but they forgot God's kindness and 
we know that God's kindness leads us to repentance. So if we're in this spot, we're forgetting God's kindness, then we're not repenting, right? So here it's, it's so evident just how the battle is because when awe of self replaces awe of God, Jesus stops being your Lord. He stops being your master, you know, and that's the reason for a lot of our personal, our relational and, you know, society, you know, dysfunction, the, you know, the source of these evil things is, a, is that we are, you know, deficient in this area of having awe of God. And this is why we do what we do. We think what we think. We desire what we desire. We, we say what we end up saying is because we don't have this off for God. And we've forgotten his kindness. We've forgotten his goodness. So tonight, you need to self-diagnose. You know, you need to do an, an awe check. <laughs> so here are some symptoms, okay? I want us to go over some symptoms, Um because sadly, we look at so many, there's so many symptoms around it, but I'm going to go over just some of the ones that we read right now in Romans, okay? The first one is adultery, immorality, and impurity. It's all in one, okay? This is an awe problem, okay? You've forgotten that you belong to God. If, if you're involved in adult, you know, um, adultery and an adulterous relationship, if you're being immoral, if you're being impure, if you're watching pornography, um, you've forgotten God's glory as the creator of your body and, and his place as owner of every aspect of your physical, of your emotional, of your mental and your spiritual person. You've forgotten and because of this, it's easier to use your body to get whatever pleasure your heart craves because you don't see that it belongs to God anymore. You think it belongs to you. So this, this is an awe problem. Number two, relational. Relational dysfunctions. Do you have a pattern of unresolved issues with sisters or a spouse or other relational problems? Um, you know, is this, is there something unresolved in your life? When we have an odd deficit, we begin to look at other people to do for us what they have no ability to do. We want others to make us feel good about ourselves. You know, uh, we want our bosses to give us praise. We want our children to give us identity, uh, our roommates to serve us. And, and we want our spouses to be our personal saviors because awe of God isn't filling our hearts. We put people where God should be. So when we do this, we put people in a position that they were never designed to fill. So they always disappoint us. We're always disappointed. It's like, because they don't belong there. Only when God takes his rightful place in our hearts, will the people near us stand in the appropriate place in our lives. Bottom line. So you need to ask yourself, in what ways do you ask things of people that they will never be able to deliver? Number three, self-centeredness, self-centeredness. Okay. Um, if you're not living in awe of God, you're left with no higher agenda than to live for yourself. And sometimes we think, oh, it's, you know, it's, I, I don't really do that, but it, when we are in this place and we've all, we all can say that we've been there. Okay. In one point or, our, or another, it comes out of our pores. Okay. Everything becomes about your wants, your needs and your feelings. And you become obsessed with your happiness and you, you know, you will think others and even think that God is also in the way of your happiness. And dysfunction will be an aspect of your life because you are in a place where you were never created to be the center <laughs> you are in the center self-centeredness you are in the center of it all and god belongs in the center of it all so ask yourself this question when do you tend to get angry because life hasn't worked out according to your plan. 
Number four, greed. This is an awe problem, okay? When your mind is blown away by the thought that God provides everything you have, that every good gift really does come from him, you are determined to be a good steward of this, of, of what you've been given, of what he's provided. You give to God first so he doesn't have to end up taking it from you. Greed is an awe problem. Number five, gluttony or overindulgence. This is an awe, an awe problem. When we forget the glory of the satisfying grace of God, we are prone to letting things like food or Starbucks drinks become our temporary replacement messiahs. And I remember, okay, when we lived in San Jose, I would go to this one coffee shop. It was amazing. You go in there and they do those little designs and then they put all this cute little colors on it. <laughs> and I realized, oh my gosh, I'm really looking forward to this coffee more than having my quiet time, you know? And um, it was like, uh, or, or even more than spending time with someone, you know, or more than the, it, I was really like looking forward to that. And in one of these coffee shops, I shared with, with this lady and um, she told me that she fast every day, you know, uh, she starts eating at noon. And I was like, really? Like, how long have you been doing this? And she, she had been doing it for a while every day. And I thought, I'm a Christian and this woman fasts more than me, you know, um, because ever since I could remember, it, it was so hard for me to fast. Like I would try to find ways to, to like, um, make it easier for me, my fast, you know, like, uh, it, this is a smoothie. I mean, it's not even solid food. Can I just have a smoothie? Come on. Like, is this, you know, this doesn't count. Um, that's who I was before. Like it was hard for me to fast from food. So ever since that day, I said, no, I'm going to fast. I'm going to do this every single day. I'm going to start eating at noon, or I'm going to fast at least 16 hours every day. And today it's number, I saw it, it's it's number 1,110 straight days of fasting. Aww. So it's been almost three years that I've done it, that I, every single day. But you know what happens because I have a, I know because I log it in on my intermittent fasting app, but the reason why I did it too is because I saw that I, I lacked self-control in that area, you know? And it, even doing that, it helped me to see, and it helps me draw closer to God. And it helps me to also grow in my self-control in other areas of my life. So, but as silly as it sounds, I had become more in awe of my mocha or my food than my God. So that's an awe problem. You know, when you feel discouraged, do you throw your boundaries of food out the window? You know, when you have your meals, do you stop yourself when you are full or do you keep eating? Um, you know, look through what you're eating physically and what you're eating spiritually. Okay. So uh, number six, number six, fear of man slash uh, insecurity. This is an awe problem. Okay. When, when I forget that it's all about God's glory and not me, then I will begin to look to people to give me meaning and to give me identity. So, you know, some of you, Satan isn't trying to take you out through immorality or impurity, okay? Some of you, he's trying to take you out through insecurity. You can fall away and it could be because of insecurity, because insecurity is pride. You know, remember that, you know, that is what, you know, that uh, through pride was what made the devil become the devil. <laughs> so it's a big deal. Don't overlook insecurity, sisters. Number seven, control. In Acts 17, verse 24 through 28, it says he determines the exact location where each of us will live and the exact span of our lives. So I remember this was one of my favorite scriptures studying the Bible because I was a hundred percent certain that God was in complete control and ruled over all things of my life. I could see it. I could see it in my life. 
from where and to whom I was born, uh, where I went to school and the people that I met, I could totally see it. He was in complete control of it all. But as time goes by, we begin to have an awe deficit and then it robs us. You know, it robs us of our rest in God's control, and it causes you to want to take control of yourself, it, you know, trying to help, trying to help God when he doesn't need your help. And you begin to get too trusting in your own ability, too trusting in your own wisdom. And you will try to control what you have little power to control like people, like places and things. You can't control those things. And because of that, you'll experience a frustration over your lack of control, right? So you see, you struggle with control, not primarily because you have a control problem, but because you have an awe problem. Remember, awe is, it's, it's yora. That's what it's yora in the, in, you know, and which means the awareness of someone else being present, not just you. You don't have to be in control of this because God is present with you, right? That, would, that is what awe means. You're forgetting that God is present in your life and you don't have control over the things around you because he is there with you. So ask yourself this question, where do you try to take control of things that you cannot actually really control? Okay, number eight, when you begin to doubt, uh, doubting, okay? So when you begin to doubt God and his goodness and his, and his plans, it's because you've lost your, your awe of God. Then what happens is that you begin to focus more on yourself and your own desires and your own, your own uh, goals and your own expectations, and they don't really involve God because you doubt in God, right? Then you define the love of God by his willingness to deliver these things that you want, but really that's not what he thinks that you need right? So then you start doubting his love and then it becomes a devastating cycle because when you doubt God's love, then you stop trusting in him and then you quit going to him for help. You quit praying. So, you know, I heard someone say, I wasn't chosen to go to LA, you know, and someone else said I was chosen, but then I didn't end up going. Well, maybe you weren't chosen to go to LA. You know, I wasn't chosen to go to Operation Jerusalem but you were chosen. You were chosen to stay in SF. So you're chosen. And what should matter most is that you're chosen by God, right? Period. <laughs> you're chosen by God, <laughs> whether it's here, Wyoming, Ghana, Hawaii, <laughs> wherever you are chosen, right? That's what you need to keep close to your heart. Not the place, not the you know, that's not important. You are chosen by God. Ask yourself, where is there evidence of doubt, of doubting God in my life? So uh, tonight, don't leave saying, oh man, well, I need to work on all of these things. No, no, no. Focus on one or two of these main symptoms in your life and then text the person in your life and then um, share them with them and ask them, you know, for prayers and then allow them to help you through with the word of God and get yourself on a plan to fight against Satan in these areas in your life. So uh, lastly, my last point, I want to talk about um, how our God, our awe of God isn't meant to be kept to ourselves. Okay. It's not meant to be kept to ourselves. Our awe of God causes us or should cause us to be outward, not inward. Okay. It's, it's meant for us to proclaim. So my last point is proclaim the abundance of awe. Okay. So we're going um, to go to Isaiah chapter six, Isaiah chapter six. And I think on, I'm going to read it here. Come on, Jackie. I'll read it here. Come on, Jackie. Okay. Isaiah 6, verse 1, it says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord, high and exalted, seated on a throne. 
and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, each uh, with six wings. With two wings, they covered their faces. With two, they covered their feet. And with two, they were flying. And they were calling to one another, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorpost and the thresholds shook. And the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried, I'm ruined. For I am a man of unclean lips. And I live among a people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongues from the altar. With it, he touched my mouth and said, see, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, here am I, send me. He said, go and tell this people, be ever hearing but never understanding, be ever seen, but never perceiving. So I love this scripture. All it took for everything that happened here to unfold was he saw the Lord. He saw the Lord. Isaiah sees the temple of God and of him standing in his presence, right? He stands in awe of who is before him and he falls to the ground and it's his majesty all around him. All he can think of is his awe deficit and the overarching symptoms, the symptoms that plague him, his sin, right? Think about that. When Isaiah was in awe of God, it led him to see and acknowledge his sin. When Isaiah was in awe of God, he saw his sin. And the lost world around him. And he was urgent. This is, this is what it should produce in us. A sober judgment of who we are and the people around us. You know, in, in verse 6, we see that, um, you know, he says, it doesn't say like, um, you know, when he puts the coal, right? He doesn't grab the coal and he's like, he, it's not like, bam, you know, like you're insane. I'm just going to throw the coal in your face. No, right? He didn't do that. He, he admitted his sin. You know, um, the nature of God was to forgive. He was forgiven. He wasn't like shot down, like, you know, in a blaze of fire. No, he was completely forgiven. God forgives us and he takes our guilt away through Jesus, of course. This is why Jesus came. We need God. You know, we need to acknowledge his presence in our lives. And in verse eight, he says, whom, he says, whom shall I send? And who will go with us? Who will go for us? For us, I love that. He puts himself like together. I'm going with you. Who's going to go with us? He doesn't list out the details of where he's sending him. He doesn't list out how much he's getting paid. He doesn't list out where he's going to live. He doesn't list out, you know, the parking situation. He doesn't list out the job situation. He doesn't list out what he's going to eat. Nothing. He doesn't do that. We are the most sendable and the most willing to do our role where we are when we are in awe of God. And I'm not just talking about sent on a mission team, okay? Like Ashley and Quaco going to Ghana, the Kalai's going <clears throat> to Japan, or the future Valdez is heading to Wyoming. I'm not just talking about that. That's super amazing. But I'm also talking about here. Here am I send me to meet the needs here. Here am I send me to step up and fill the gaps in the church right now, when you're in awe of God, oh you will be the doorkeeper and you will stand at the door and you will be fired up. You will be translating. You will be passing out whatever you need to pass out, trays, whatever. You're not thinking about the role when you're in awe of God. You're just wanting to help and meet any need possible. And, and I'm also talking about the here am I send me to serve my roommates. Here am I send me to help with the children. Here am I send me um, to say no to temptation. Here am I send me uh, to lead a Bible talk. 
to lead that Bible study that maybe I haven't led in a long time, but I'll do it by faith because it's the word of God. You know, here am I send me to stand in awe of God. And Isaiah, with the understanding that his guilt has been removed, his sins have been forgiven, he loudly proclaims this. He says, here am I, send me. See, the awe of God, it demands a response. It demands action. You can't say that you're an awe of God and not do anything, <laughs> right? In Acts 4.20, it says, uh, as for us, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. And this is when they were trying to silence Peter. He's like, no, I'm not going to be silent. I'm not going to be silent of what I've seen and what I've heard. I can't. You know, the abundance of awe in our lives compels us to use our past to save others. The abundance of awe, it prevents us from staying in our comfort zone. The abundance of awe leads us to take this message and what we've experienced in our lives and to use it to help a lost world. It helps us. It opens our eyes, you know, to, to people out there who know God, but don't really know God, the real God, you know? So in closing, sadly, we live in a time where there is a higher degree of awe in what has been created than the creator himself. But not in this group, right? Not in this group of women. We are those who stand in awe and revere his word in our lives. We are those who bend our wills when we see these symptoms of an awe deficit. We are those who are willing to go and proclaim this to the lost world. Let's all be women who stand in awe and are captivated by our great God. I love you all. To God be the glory. Come on, Jackie.